So I was looking online for some research data on the latest state of play in the lithium ion battery recycling industry. And I found this weighty tome from the website Research and Markets, the self-proclaimed world's largest market research store. The real version of this thing, as opposed to the virtual version that I'm animating here, is more than 400 pages long, and the Research and Markets website tells me it could be mine for the bargain price of only £4,508, which is about $6,000. Now don't get me wrong, I love doing research, but I'll be honest, I don't love it enough to shell out that kind of money. Luckily though, the good folks at Research and Markets are kind enough to provide the broad headlines on their website. So what are they then? Well, the global lithium ion battery recycling industry was valued at just over $7 billion in 2024, and it's projected to jump up to almost 24 billion by 2030, which for these statisticians among you, represents a compound annual growth rate of almost 22% which is a pretty steep curve. Unsurprisingly then, there is feverish activity going on all over the planet to develop a standout process for dismantling these notoriously complicated articles and effectively separating out all the constituent parts into reusable piles without necessarily using huge amounts of energy to melt them or nasty chemicals to dissolve them. And that's proving to be quite a tricky challenge. Now though, a team of science bods in China, of course, reckons they've come up with a process that ticks both those boxes and recovers virtually 100% of the materials in less than 15 minutes. So we should probably have a look at that, shouldn't we? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. There's lots of good stuff going on in the lithium ion battery recycling world right now, spurred in part by new EU legislation that comes into force in August 2030. That law states that electric vehicle batteries produced by European car makers will have to contain a minimum of 6% each of recycled lithium and nickel and 16% of cobalt, with those proportions rising still further in 2035. That's got European recyclers racing to get ahead of their global competitors, mainly coming from China, which currently dominates the industry with a whopping 70% of global share. 2.0 in Munich, Germany for example, is developing a process that it claims has net zero emissions and can recover all critical materials, including industrial scale graphite. Altilium in the UK reckons its process can reduce the overall CO2 emissions of a typical battery by 70% and lower the cost by 20%. Then there's a slew of companies over in North America, perhaps the best known of which is Redwood Materials in Nevada, founded by ex-Tesla CTO J.B. Straubel. They use mechanical shredding and hydrometallurgy to recover 95% of lithium, cobalt, nickel and copper. Just a very quick 101 on hydrometallurgy. Why not? In this process, the packs first have to be physically dismantled to separate out some of the easily removable materials like plastic casings and aluminium trays, all of which get sent to a normal recycling plant. The battery modules themselves then get dumped into a shredder where they're ground up into tiny fragments in a completely enclosed inert or vacuum environment so that nothing explodes or catches fire. The liquid electrolyte is evaporated off in the process and later condensed back out into a liquid for reuse. Depending on the specific configuration of the batteries, what you get out of the other end of the shredder is a pile of granulated materials like aluminium, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, graphite, and copper. The granules then get screened to separate out the aluminium and copper, plus any last bits of plastic from the internal components of the cell packs. And that leaves a fine powder, which the industry refers to as black mass, containing all the really valuable materials from the battery electrodes, including lithium. The black mass then gets dissolved in an acid bath before going through a process known as solvent extraction to separate out the different materials which are then ready to be packaged up and reused in new battery production. It's a process that's also employed at American Battery Technology Company, or ABTC, also in Nevada, with a closed loop so-called feedstock agnostic process to recover lithium, nickel, cobalt, and manganese. A third Nevadan operation called Aqua Metals uses an electrohydrometallurgy process that they call aqua refining to liberate lithium, cobalt, and nickel, with a claimed 95% reduction in waste compared to traditional hydrometallurgy. Lie Cycle up in Toronto, Canada, goes one step further, claiming to recover all the critical materials plus the plastics from housings and casings. Over in British Columbia, there's Recycli Co, 
who offer on-site recycling modules targeting 99% recovery of cathode materials, and down in Oz, an Adelaide company called Ion Drive is working on recycling methods using benign organic solvents, which they say significantly reduces environmental impacts compared to traditional methods. And there are plenty of others vying for market share all over the world. So, you know, it's a busy field. So what have these new Chinese upstarts come up with then? And why do they think it represents a potential advantage over what's out there right now? Well, the team was essentially looking for ways to minimise the use of strong acids and bases in the hydrometallurgical process. Acid leaching is a nice, cheap, simple process with good material recovery efficiency, but it's quite slow and it releases toxic gases and creates a significant wastewater management problem. Ammonia can be used to do the leaching job as well, but it also has the nasty side effect of choking to death anyone who comes anywhere near the reaction unless they're wearing the correct safety gear. So that's not ideal either, is it? Plus, the ammonia method is relatively inefficient, so it doesn't scale very well to deal with the volume of spent lithium-ion batteries, or SLIBs, that will be arriving like a tsunami in the next couple of decades. What you really want is some kind of neutral solution that can persuade the various metals to come out of the black mass without all the nasty side reactions. The team from China's Central South University and the National Engineering Research Center of Advanced Energy Storage Materials reckon they've achieved that using glycine, which is a very common and fairly benign amino acid. The challenge here is to replicate the aggressive ability of hydrogen ions in acids and the very base attributes of ammonia to break down the metal oxygen bonds that form inside the oxides in battery cathodes. Neutral reactants have been tried before, but they generally lack the energy needed to provoke an efficient reaction, and so a pre-treatment step is required using high temperature processes like chloride roasting and sulfuric acid roasting to do a bit of the initial persuading. That adds a bunch of additional energy requirements into the process and, you know, chloride roasting and sulfuric acid roasting, you don't really want all that, do you? Glycine, according to the authors of this paper, has dual functionality thanks to these two groups that enable both ligand complexation and pH self-regulation simultaneously. Yeah, so what's that all about then? Well, ligands are essentially molecules that can attach to metal ions. They're useful in recycling because they can grab onto metals like nickel and cobalt and pull them into a solution that can then be recovered. This part of the glycine is an amine group that's happy to donate a pair of electrons from its nitrogen. And this other part is a carboxylic acid group that does the job of releasing hydrogen ions. Both of those groups are attractive to metals and that makes glycine perform well as a ligand. The so-called pH self-regulation thing is also very useful. In a normal process, the operator would need to monitor the pH level of the reaction and add a bit more acid or a bit more of a base to keep the pH value in the desired range. But glycine can do that itself. If the solution gets too basic, then the carboxylic acid group can release more hydrogen ions or protons. And if it gets too acidic, then the amine molecules can pull more protons out. In other words, glycine buffers the pH naturally without needing a bunch of nasty additional chemicals. But that's not the only insight that the Chinese team provided us with. They also describe what they call a solid-solid reduction design in situ constructed primary battery effect. And in plain English, the primary batteries effect refers to a situation where two solid materials, usually two different metals or metal compounds, come into contact with each other and start acting like the parts of a primary or non-rechargeable battery. That interaction causes a spontaneous flow of electrons, just like a regular battery powering a device. The researchers found that they could exploit this phenomenon to speed up the process of breaking down the metals inside the recycled battery, boosting the performance of the glycine, making the process faster and more effective, all without using harsh chemicals. According to the lab test, and yes, I know, lab tests, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, according to the lab tests, the whole process can be achieved in just 15 minutes. And in its current iteration, it can recover 99.9% .9 of the lithium, 96.8% of the nickel, 92.35% of the cobalt, and 90.59% of the manganese from a spent lithium ion battery. 
What that potentially means is fast, safe lithium ion battery recycling in neutral conditions without the environmental and human health hazards of other processes. And although this has so far only been demonstrated in a laboratory, it does look like one of those rare concepts that could quite easily be scaled up to meet the needs of mass throughput. And here's the thing, those folks who are still desperately looking for reasons not to embrace the transition from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles are kind of running out of problems to highlight as safety, range, convenience, charging network proliferation, product choice, and even the cost differential between EVs and ICE vehicles have all been addressed and pretty much resolved in recent years. So they're only really left with the rather porous argument about the environmental pollution caused by the mining of metals for the batteries. To be honest, that's already a spurious argument anyway when properly set against the truly mind-boggling levels of environmental pollution that come from the mining, shipping, processing and burning of fossil fuels. But now even that forlorn attempt at naysaying the transport revolution will have to be shelved once the recycling industry kicks into top gear in the coming years. And if processes like this latest one can be employed to improve safety in the workplace and minimise the environmental impacts of processing plants, then we might genuinely be able to claim that electric vehicles are just a bit more sustainable than the outdated and hopelessly inefficient gas guzzlers we currently have to put up with. No doubt there will be plenty of you out there with your own point of view on this topic. So if you're burning with an uncontrollable desire to share that view right now, then the place to do just that is in the comments section below. That's it for this week though. Thanks as always to the amazing folks over at Patreon who make this channel possible and enable me to keep ads and sponsorship messages out of your way. If you feel like you'd like to get involved with that, then jump over to patreon.com forward slash just have a think to find out how you can join the team and have a look at all the exclusive perks you can get there, including direct access to me via dedicated chat forums, early access to all my videos, and an opportunity to shape the direction of the channel in monthly content polls. And if you enjoyed this video, then you can really hugely support the work I do here by hitting the subscribe button on YouTube and clicking on all notifications. Won't cost you a penny to do that, and it's just a simple click away, either down there somewhere or on that icon there. Most important of all though, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.